Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. That is what we are here to celebrate today. Y'all got quiet too fast. Let's go ahead and give another round of applause. Yeah. We're here to celebrate Jesus. They did a whole lot of work for us. I think we can give them a couple little claps. <clears throat> this is uh, Resurrection Sunday. I welcome all of you. I don't know how many of you are, are here. It's your first time in a long time. Uh, I am Jared Cochran. If you are disappointed, come back next week and Pastor Philip will be here. Um, but not for much longer. So if you're disappointed now, you're going to be disappointed in the long run. <laughs> but um, no, I, wanna, I really want to take the time to say thank you for coming out. Um, I said at the nine that, you know, there is any number of churches that you could have gone to today, uh, even on just this street alone, or stayed home and watched online because you have too much social social anxiety to do anything anymore. But uh, I don't take it lightly that you chose to celebrate with us here at Family Church, so thank you for that. Um, You know, I'm sorry if you were expecting a big play and all of that. We don't really do that here. Uh, Not that there's anything wrong with it, but... um, I like to keep church consistent in the same, you know, everybody always says that there's a problem with the people that only celebrate on Easter and Resurrection Sunday. I don't like when you go to a church and you get a complete false advertisement of what the church is. So if you go to a church and they put on all this big production and then you go back the next week and it looks nothing like what you saw the week before, I kind of have a little bone to pick with that. I I think it should stay consistent. This morning... We are speaking out of Ephesians chapter 1, and if we could all rise for the reading of the Word of God, I will be starting in verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And I don't know about you, I am super excited that we have the redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our sins because of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of of his glory. How many are thankful that we are sealed with a promise? This morning, this morning, I want to talk to you about the plan, the plan. And there's three things we're going to cover. We're going to have rebellion. We're going to have redemption. And then we're going to have renovation. Everybody say rebellion, Rebellion. redemption, Redemption. Renovation. renovation. Father, we thank you for the word that you have brought forth today. We thank you for the worship that you are already here, Lord. This is for some of us, this is the, uh, the double dip. And if the nine o'clock was a testament to how good you are, God, I pray that you show up just as much, if not more, Father. Use me as your vessel, Lord, in your name. Amen. amen. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys um, spend any time on YouTube or watching anything like that. Of course not. I'm sure all you do is spend all of your time on uh, Yippee or whatever that Christian one is. No Netflix. Um, but I, I've, I've recently, I've, I've come across a lot of these videos of that guy. His name's Cliff something. Maybe you've heard of him. He's like an older gentleman that 
goes to colleges and preaches to all these kids at the colleges. And there was one I came across where there was, uh, he was debating an atheist and the, uh, he asked, you know, the atheist, what would it take for you to be a Christian? Like if the, if the Bible were true, what would it take for you to give your life to Jesus? And the, the, uh, the atheist, he said, well, I need more information. What, what does that mean? And he said, you know, following his commands, following Jesus, following his commands. To which the atheist replied, it would depend on if I agreed with his commands or not. <clears throat> Which, when we immediately knuckle up at that, we see the picture of the problem with people is that it is our pride. It's really not evidence that's keeping people from Jesus anymore. It's all just our pride because we don't really want to follow anything other than our own path. We know that Satan fell from heaven ultimately because of his pride, because he wanted to be God. He didn't even want to be like God. He literally wanted to be God. So then he came down. Oh, well, he was already down. He tempted man and made mankind full of pride because of sin. And pride is what is, uh, pride is believing that we are greater than God and we can do it all on our own. We think we can do it better than God. Pride is what has led us to the point that we are at today because it is pride that led to the rebellion. So how did we get here? We know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when you look at Colossians 1.16, we know that it was through Jesus, in Jesus, by Jesus, that everything was created for Jesus. It is all about Jesus. And you wonder now when you, when you watch the news or step outside and look at anything, you wonder, how, how did we get here if it was so good? Because obviously when the earth was created, everything was good. It was a paradise. You had, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, they were naked without shame, which is, we'll just leave that there. But there was no sin. There was no sickness. You didn't really have to work very hard. There wasn't uh, taxes, you know, taking all of your paycheck. The world was this wonderful, beautiful place until people got involved. Because people are the ones that started the problem because God gave us free will. But free will is uh, free will, but deception, excuse me, led us to our destruction. Satan came along and as he always does, he twists God's word. So, you know, he came up to Eve and he said, oh, you know, did he really say you can't eat from any tree? You know, surely you're not going to die. Satan likes to take, he likes to initiate a conversation with you by twisting God's word. He likes to twist God's word because, you know, oh, surely you won't die. And they didn't die immediately. They immediately died spiritually, but it took time. That is, I believe that's when time began, when they finally disobeyed and, and uh, were led by Satan into the deception. And a lot of us, you know, in, in, in church and in the Christian culture, we always give Eve a lot of flack, you know, oh, it's, it's because of women. It's because of Eve that we're in this mess. It's all, it's all the girl's fault. But you have to understand that she didn't realize that Satan was deceiving her into disobedience. Right. Come on. Yeah. See, up until this point, all she's known is her husband, Adam, and God. She's only known good, and she's only known the truth. This is literally the first time that she would have heard a lie. She's never heard a lie yet. The enemy always twists God's word, which is exactly why we need God to transform our minds. And instead, instead of living with God in the garden... Now we have a world full of evil and deception and disease because we betrayed his commands. And evil is what happens when you live backwards from God. That's right. When you turn your back on God, it sounds like a fun little play on words, but evil is what you get when you turn your back from God. That's right. yeah. And we were supposed to have dominion over the world. We were supposed to rule the world with God, to walk in the garden with God. God, but instead now we are being ruled by the results of our sin. But how many are thankful today on this beautiful resurrection Sunday that even in our disobedience, God makes a way. He always gives a way to come back to him. He always provides a path back to him. You might not be pursuing God, but I can promise you he is pursuing you. In Genesis, in Genesis 3, verses uh, 21 and on, Adam and Eve, they get banished from the garden. They get kicked out of the garden. They are removed 
from God's presence. But in this, you see that God literally sacrifices an animal and clothes them with the skin of an animal. He covers them even though they're in their disobedience. This is a picture of the future of what Jesus has done for each and every single one of us in this room, all the way back in Genesis. The Bible is all a story about Jesus, all of it. You can find people that you will relate to, whether it's David or Elijah or John the Baptist, and you want to be like all organic and eating locusts and honey, but it is all about Jesus. God intended for us to subdue the world, to rule it on his terms. But we ultimately rejected his authority and we rebelled against him. And sin entered the world because we decided that we would define our own terms of good and evil. Instead of following God's terms, we would uh, identify, if you will, our own terms. People think, you know, God just made up all these rules and they'll reject him. But God didn't make rules to restrict us. He created boundaries intended to bless us and to keep us safe and protected out of the goodness of his heart. But out of all of the good that he created, out of everything in the garden, all the trees, all the fruit, everything that you could imagine, we did the typical human thing and we focused on the one thing that we couldn't have because we think that it can bring us something, something more. We think we're always lacking something. We're always looking at everybody else for what they have, what they can offer us how much more money we can make, how, how, you know, a new car that we can buy, new shoes that we can get, and, and not that any of that is bad, but we always look at what we don't have instead of the God that we do have. And instead, a rebellion and betrayal brought sin into the world. It brought sickness into the world. It brought disease into the world, and it brought violence into the world. All of the bad that you see going on right now is a result of the betrayal of man. And maybe you're one of the ones that wonder, why would God even make it? If he knew this was going to happen, why would he even create all of this? Why didn't he just make everybody be good? Well, that's because it wouldn't be free will. Why would God even create the world? Isaiah 43, the chapter is called Israel's only savior. And in verse seven, it tells us that God created it all for his glory. His glory is the beauty of who he is, his attributes, everything rolled into one ball. It was all created for his glory, to point to him and to show him off. Have you ever been around the people that always want to show off their kids? And it's infinitely more annoying. I don't know if it's worse if you have kids or if you don't have kids. Because if you don't have kids, you really just don't care. But if you do, you're like, I I only like mine. I don't care about yours. That's cute. Awesome. Wow, they lost a tooth. Great. Woo. Happy for you. Please go away. <laughs> or it, it, if they don't have kids and all they want to do is like post their truck on Instagram or something like that, you know, look at what I have now. But pictures, everybody wants to show us pictures through the filter of the lens that makes you think they have something more going on. Right. But pictures are intended, pictures are designed and intended to point back at something, to invoke a memory. We have the Amazon Fire Stick at our house. And I'm always putting the, the uh, pictures that we take. And here I am making fun of people talking about their kids, but I'm going to talk about my kids. But, uh, you know, we put the pictures on there. And Kelsey and I, a lot of times, we'll just spend like an hour or two just going through all the memories, just watching the screensaver with all the memories and stuff. And that's the point of the picture, to show something off, to remember something. And in Genesis 1:27, if you didn't know this, we are created in the image of God. We are created in God's image. And that is one of the reasons why God told the Israelites not to create idols. <laughs> There's all these other people in the Bible that they worship these false gods. And every time it's the little G gods, it's talking about demons. Okay? They create idols. These other kings, these other people, they puff themselves up. They make statues of themselves. Literally, the Hebrew term for the statue is idols. They make idols of themselves. And this is why God's people, they didn't view their kings as God. They didn't view each other as God. They knew that they're not supposed to make images or idols because God cannot be reduced down to any single thing. He's too immense. He's too magnificent. He is too awesome. He is too glorious. He is too great to be contained into any one single idol. And yet he chooses to dwell within each and every one of us. He chooses. And God didn't want his people to make images of any fake God or even of himself because he already made the image. He made 
us. That is us. We are images of God. Isaiah 43.10, we are his witnesses. We're supposed to show him off. We are supposed to point back to God. When somebody looks at you, they should see the glory of God. They should see the beauty of his creation. Red, brown, yellow, black, or white. They should see who God is when they look at you. But instead, we rebelled and we rejected him and we continue to reject him every single day of our lives. Because in our stupid little heads, we think that we know what we're doing and we've got it all figured out and we can go a better way. We removed ourselves from God. We removed ourselves from his presence. And it costs us everything. It cost us everything. We sold ourselves to sin and God knew that he has to buy us back. He had to buy us back. This is what redemption is. Redemption means to buy back. In Ephesians 1 verse 7 that we read earlier, it is the act of paying to free a slave. We are sinful in nature because of Adam, because of the fall, but we continue to sell ourselves willingly to the slavery of sin every day because we think it feels good. We think it feels great. We think it feels awesome to live on our own terms, but we don't understand the cost. Death is the cost of disobedience to God. Death is the cost. And I know that that is harsh, that you imagine, oh, if I reject God, why do I have to go to hell? Why is death the cost of my disobedience? But we have no problem with speeding down the road and accepting the fact that if you go out of here and cut somebody off of traffic and drive recklessly, you're going to get a ticket. If you run a red light, you're going to get a ticket. If they mess up your order at McDonald's and you want to punch them in the mouth, you're going to go to jail. If you murder somebody, you're going to go to jail. When you reject the law of man, jail is where you go for your disobedience. It is the consequence of your own choice. Hell is where you go for disobeying and rejecting God. And I know, I know it sounds harsh, but it is the consequence of your own choices. It is. And I'm not here, I'm not going to hang out on this to scare you into salvation because that is not going to transform your heart. You can go to any other church in the world and hear about how you're a terrible person and everybody hates you and you're going to hell. You ain't going to hear that here because that is never going to transform your heart. I am never going to speak like that. Jesus did not condemn anyone. He came to love them. He loved them first. God, but God, the the thing is, God is completely holy. So he can't dwell where sin is. Sin cannot be where God is. This is why they couldn't touch the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, because man is full of sin. This is why there was the Holy of Holies in the temple, and only the high priest could go in there once a year. And this is why when Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn. So God was showing them and showing you, showing us that the veil is torn. The separation is lifted. The barrier between God and man is no more. It is gone in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But why redeem us? Why redeem us? Because we choose to reject him. We choose to betray him. We choose to leave him blaspheme him, mock him, spit him, spit on him. We choose to try and lift ourselves up and become like him. In 2 Peter 2, 4, we see that God didn't spare the angels. We know that Satan and all the other little dumb demons that went with him, they're not going to spend eternity in heaven. They're not going to be forgiven. They're going to spend eternity in hell. And that is the thing. God did not have to save any of us. He didn't have to save you. He didn't have to save me. He was under no obligation to do a single thing. He could have chosen with perfect justice to leave us in our sins awaiting our judgment. And we see where rebellion has gotten us. Because instead of subduing the world and cultivating it, we are suffering in the chaos of our own creations. We create all of these weapons to kill each other with. We create drugs to kill each other with. We create laws that make absolutely zero sense and do nothing but harm each other. We make bombs to blow up whole cities to kill each other just so we can destroy each other and destroy God's creation. And all we have done is make a mess of things. And that is exactly why we needed the Messiah to step into our mess. And if redemption is buying us back, it does require a payment. And we have a whole lot of debt to pay off. So what are you worth? 
What are you worth? Because in business, the value of something is determined by what you'll pay for it. We remember when phones used to be a couple hundred dollars and now they're like six months worth of work, but we'll still go out and get the new iPhone every year. What are you worth? I know that uh, if you're like me, you spent forever trying to figure out what you're going to wear on Easter because, you know, you got to look good for everybody else, even though they're going to look at you and not care. I'm just kidding. You all look beautiful by today, or by the way, today. But are you worth that? Are you worth the couple hundred dollars that, are, that is clothing your body right now and your watches and your phones? Is that what you place your worth in? What are you worth? And think about your life. Ask the question in the 9 a.m. Are you worth buying back? Are you worth buying back? I'm going to pick on you. You said yes and a couple people said yes. Are you worth? Do you really think? Because to me, I'm like, whoa, pride. I don't really think I'm good enough to buy back. Exactly. But God, the thing is, God didn't have to. God didn't have to. We rejected him over and over and over again. So why? Why did Jesus choose to come down and suffer? Why did he choose to leave his throne in heaven, become a man, and choose to be subjected to 40 days of assault in the wilderness by the devil? We know that growing up, he would have suffered the griefs and the aches and pains of going through maturity and puberty. We know that he was beaten and he endured Three years of opposition by religious people. And if he were on the internet today, you know he would have been canceled in about five minutes of his first message. (laughs) And nothing would have been able to get out. Because, you know, right now it's just a trend to attack any Christian, any preacher, if they've got any sort of platform. Any sort of influence, any sort of platinum platform, they are throwing everything at you to drag your name through the dirt. It is a trend. Side note for the Christians. Get back to making converts for the body and stop creating division within the body. And scripture doesn't mention the death of Joseph. But after Jesus is 12, we don't hear anything else about Joseph, his earthly father. So we can assume that he would have suffered the grief of losing his father on earth and the cross. We know how he was beaten but, and I'm not going to, I don't want to hang too much on it, but the cross, we know that crucifixion was a brutal, agonizing, slow death by suffocation. Some people didn't even make it through the flogging. On top of the beatings that he took of the, the, the cat of nine tails, we know his hands and his feet were nailed to a rough cut of wood. The positioning of it made it to where it was hard to exhale. I don't know how long you can hold your breath underwater But when you start getting a little bit close to the edge, you're like, dear Lord, I hope I can make it back up and get some air. You couldn't exhale. So in order to try to breathe out and breathe back in, you had to push against the nails in your feet, enduring the searing pain of that just to try to take a breath. And the position of your hands, when you would push up on your feet, not only does your feet hurt, you're pushing against the nails in your wrist, creating that pain. Oh, and then all the open wounds that are on your back that are now scraping against a rough piece of wood, so you're getting splinters and all of that. Crucifixion was referred to as the drawing the breath, as drawing the breath of life amid long, drawn out agony. I just found this out last night, the, the part of scripture where they mentioned that the sponge that was soaked in vinegar and stuck in his mouth. Apparently, the sponge was used for Roman soldiers when they were at war to wash themselves. And not only wash themselves, it was what we would have for toilet paper. So they would dip it in the vinegar so it would be like an antiseptic. And then when they were done using the bathroom, they would scrape all of that fun stuff off. And so literally the final words of Jesus were spoken with the remains of human excrement and a bowel movement in his mouth. Disgusting. In some cases, they would survive. Some people survived for up to nine days. That is why in John 19, you see that they would break their legs to try to kill them faster. And not only the physical pain of the cross, but the psychological pain. We know the sting of our sin. We know the anguish and the guilt that we feel. You know how bad it feels when you mess up. You know how ridiculous it feels when you're done and you got to clean your browser history up before your wife gets home. We have that heavy, sinking feeling, that bitter sense of separation. We feel the separation from God. We know something is off 
because of our choices. We know the separation from God because of our choices. And this is why, and I said it Wednesday, God doesn't really choose who goes to hell. We do. We get to pick. He makes the terms and you get to decide which one you're going to. It is all your decision. Hell is a terrible place. And what it is, is complete eternal separation from God. But we have free will to make our own choices. So when you choose to live a life separate from God, he's going to give you over to the consequences of your choices and you will spend eternity by your own decision separated from God. Or you can choose to accept him and live this life with him and spend eternity with him. They are both your choice. Joe Costello, Wednesday night, said in one of the comments on our YouTube, there's two kinds of people, people on Judgment Day. Those who look to God and say, thy will be done. And those that God looks at and he says, thy will be done. Jesus felt that at the cross. He felt the physical pain and he felt the psychological pain. Because he is perfectly holy, because he hates sin. It goes against everything, every fiber of who he is. Just as mankind rebels against God and we look at him and we tell him, no thanks, I don't want any part of that, I don't want any part of you, Jesus rebelled against sin and he rejected it. He never gave in to temptation, he lived the only perfect life. He looked at all of that and he said, no thanks, I don't want any part of that. He rebelled against sin, he rebelled against religion, he rebelled against sickness, he rebelled against disease, and evil and he ultimately rebelled against death he looked at all of that and he said no thanks in my kingdom there is none of that i don't want any part of that because sin goes against everything that jesus is so not only did he experience the physical pain he had the psychological pain the separation from god because of the weight of sin and this is why he cries out my god my god why have you forsaken me because he has never felt it before He came down from heaven where he had eternal harmony with the Father, where he had eternal peace. He's never been without his Father until this moment. So why now? Why bear the weight of sin, of guilt, of rejection? Why bear the shame? Why feel the separation for literally every single person in the world? Every single person. And that is not just at his time. That's not just at our time. That is past, present, and future. The weight of the entire world for all of existence. Past, present, and future. All of the weight of the sin and the shame and the guilt. All of the murder. All of the bitterness. All of the rejection. Everything. He felt it on the cross. So why? And maybe you remember this verse if you've heard anything of church, church, and it's in John chapter 3. And if you know it, I think you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved the world. If he needed to just be sinless, he could have died as a child and not as a 33-year-old man. He had no need to live a life of perfect obedience. For his sake, he did it all for you. He did it all for you to fulfill all righteousness for our sake. Just as God thought of all of our sin as belonging to Jesus on the cross, he thinks of Jesus' righteousness as belonging to us. God regards us as righteous because he knows that Jesus is in us and we are in him. So when the devil wants to attack your anointing and when he wants to assault you, when he wants to remind you of your past, you need to look him in the face and remind him of his future. When he wants to get you to question your calling, when he wants to get you to think that you're not good enough, when he wants to get you to think that you will never amount to anything, you've got to look him right back in the face and tell him, I've got a God that is greater. I've got a God that is bigger. I've got a God that is louder. I've got a God that is stronger. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God is enough. I never have to be and never had to be good enough because Jesus is more than enough. And he lives in me. And if Christ is in me, then I am enough. And you may not feel like enough right now, but God says you are worth it now just like you were worth it back then. The price paid for your redemption is the blood of Jesus. Is there any greater cost? Could anything make you worth more? 
There is a daily battle for all of us to base our self-worth, our worth on anything other than the price of Jesus. The price that Jesus paid for. We will base it on our accomplishments, how good we're doing at work, if we've got the promotion. We'll base it on if our family looks better than the other family. We'll base it on everything other, other than Jesus. We will base it on our money. We'll base it on our wealth. We'll base it on our family. Some of you will base it off of your race. That's a hard one, huh? We don't want to think about that. We'll base it off of our education. We'll base it off of our ego. We'll base it off of if we're getting enough likes and followers on the gram so we can be the social influencer and not have to work and just sit at home. We are either desperately trying to prove our worth or we are living in depression feeling like we aren't worth anything. But God says that you are and you were worth it all. God laid it all down. He left heaven and became a man. He came down and laid his life down for you so that you don't have to. All out of his love for you. You never did anything to make God love you. And you can never do anything to make him stop loving you. He left perfect harmony for you because he loves you. And if I haven't done a good enough job of proving it, look back at Ephesians 1, verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The cross was not a surprise of sin. It was not an afterthought of Adam and Eve. Jesus' work on the cross was planned from eternity's past. Before anyone could choose Christ or deny his deity, the cross was the plan. It wasn't plan A. It wasn't plan B. It was the only plan. Before you took your first breath, it was the plan. Before your parents even existed, it was the plan. Before your depression settled over your life, it was the plan. Before anxiety and your addiction and your bitterness and your broken heart has gripped gripped you, it was the plan. Before sexual slavery, anything, it was the plan. Before God made the birds in the sky, before the fish in the sea, and before anything you have waiting for you at home, God already looked forward. Before there was any human sin to even die for, God looked forward and he laid it all out and he set the plan in motion out of love. Before he formed you, he already loved you. Before he created Adam, he already loved you. Before he created the world, he already loved you. Before anything was ever spoken into existence, he already loved us enough to set it forth that he would die for us. Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb's book of life is referred to as the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. It was all out of love, all for his glory, and only a way that he could make it happen. The greatest story to ever unfold, and that is still unfolding, is right here in the Bible. Everything before the cross pointed to it, and everything after the cross points back at it. In the garden... The fruit was stolen from the tree. Jesus died on a tree because God is putting it back there for us. His hands were pierced because with their hands, they stole from the tree. His feet were pierced because the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3 says that you shall bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. His side is pierced because Eve came from his side and God made atonement for her sin. A crown of thorns is placed on his head because God in Genesis 3 said, cursed is the ground. Thorns and thistles thistles it shall bring for you. And he was literally taking the curse on his head to restore us, to reverse it, to take off the burden of sin, to take off the, the, the sins of us and reverse everything. He became sin in order to free us and pay for our sin. He paid the ultimate price. He paid the only price of our redemption in order to bring restoration that is supposed to then lead us to a renovation. A renovation is to restore to a former state, to restore to a better state, to restore to life. And in order to restore to a former state, in order to restore to a better state, there has to be something already there to return to. And this is what God is doing. He is reconciling the world to him. He's bringing us all back to him. He wants us to return to who we are truly supposed to be. 
He knew you before he formed you. And before all of the mess in your life, he already knows the true you. The one before the world got its hands on you. Before the enemy and the accuser started assaulting you, he already knew you. He knows everything about you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows the bitterness in your heart, the pain in your heart, the broken heart that you feel, the rejection. He knows all of your mess, and he still decided to show you mercy. And mercy is God giving us, not giving us, what we deserve. God doesn't give us death. He removes it and he gives us life. He doesn't give us shame. He removes it and he gives us salvation. He doesn't give us lies because he is the truth. He doesn't give us guilt. He gives us the the gift of his grace. And grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. Redemption, salvation, being freed from our sins. It was not an afterthought. It was not a surprise. It was the plan all along, always the plan. Grace is the summit of the mountain of his glory. And he created the world for his glory. He planned the world for the glory of his grace. It is his grace that brought us our redemption. And it is redemption that is supposed to lead us to a renovation. His grace should captivate you. His grace should grip you. You should be so gripped by grace because once God gets a hold of you, there is nothing that is going to stop it. There is no height. There is no depth. There is no devil in hell that can ever stand against you because when you have the glory of God within you, nothing can come against you. It is time to wake up the warrior within you because you have a lion inside of you. You have the lion of the tribe of Judah and it is time for the world to hear him roar. This was always the plan. This is the restoration of his people for his glory. And we are God's image bearers, but Jesus is the image of God. He is the new human. He is the true way to be human. We have to get back to Jesus. Our renovation begins with a recovery, a recovery of Jesus, of who Jesus is, of who Jesus was, of what Jesus said, of what Jesus did. Satan has blinded the world for extremely far too long, and he has dimmed the light of God in as many ways as he can, and everything he has done is to blunt the world to the Spirit of God. It is time to pick back up the Word. It is time to pick back up your sword of truth and reawaken who you were always meant to be, and that is like Jesus. Jesus became like us so that we can become like him. The enemy has dimmed your perception to your purpose for too long and you need to regain the intense desire to be like Jesus again. He became flesh. He took on the sin of the entire world so that we could become glorious like him, so that we can reign with him. What God wants to do in you and through you and what the Holy Spirit is joyfully committed to working out through you and through your mind and through your heart and through your soul and your spirit is a renovation. He wants to excavate the enemy in your life. He wants to excavate the evil in your life. And Jesus is the only blueprint that you will ever need. The only person you need to try to strive to be like is Jesus. It's not LeBron. It's not Joe Rogan. It's not Andrew Tate. It is Jesus. He is the only person that you should try to be like. And we've got to spend less time on social media and more time in the scripture. We've got to get off of Hulu and spend more time with the Holy Spirit. We need to stop spending so much time in the world and get back into his word. We need to quit wasting all of our time shopping on Amazon Prime and let the amazing God who created us and breathed life into us get a grip back on our soul and restore us into what we were supposed to be, what we have always called to be. Because once he is in you, you cannot contain it. You cannot control it. Once he is in you, you've got to tell somebody. You can't hide it. You're not supposed to put your light under a a bushel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel because one Jesus truly gets a hold of you there is nothing that can stop you there is nothing that can stop the glory of God he will renew you, he will renew your strength, he will renew your heart he will renew your mind, he will renew your soul and your spirit and he will transform you from the inside out and that is what sanctification is, it is a lifelong process but the church people and the hyper religious people expect it to be an immediate transformation, they expect it to be oh you got Jesus Everything's good. Don't do anything else or you're out of the church. They think you've got to have it all together before you can step foot in their building. They think you've got to have it all together before you 
even attempt to talk to Jesus. I have caught so much hell for saying that if you were drunk when you came into church, I'm glad you're here. If you were high, I'm glad you're here. Because this is where you're supposed to be. This is where you're supposed to be. That is not how the gospel works, having it all together before you do anything with Jesus. That's how you got church hurt. Because somebody had their own set of rules and they thought you were, they were better than you and they caused you to fall away and get church hurt and because they wanted to judge their performance against your performance in order to feel better about their insecurities and their hidden sins. But nobody, nobody has ever been more church hurt than Jesus. They literally killed him. And I'll tell you what, if he showed up today, he would have died a whole lot faster than he did back then. We live in a time of the internet where you can access all sorts of information immediately and instead all you get is the immediate transfer of ignorance. We don't read anything anymore. God forbid what a book is if they even know how to spell it. We don't read articles anymore. We read headlines. And forget doing your own research. If your uncle's cousin said it on Facebook, it's got to be true. Don't look it up. Just hit share and move on with your day. You are basing your whole life on someone's complete lack of knowledge, especially on TikTok. All the hacks. Here's a hack. Pick up a Bible and get back to the God. People will look at what somebody else says about someone, and then it will spread like wildfire. And nobody wants to have a conversation with this person anymore. Nobody wants to even attend their church or do any research on them because they're just going to regurgitate the ridiculousness that everyone else says, and they don't even know why they're saying it. We have learned to hate people literally only because other people hate them. And in the age of accusation and misunderstanding, you would figure that the church would be what it is always meant to be, which is a hospital for the broken. But instead... Instead, we are trying to turn it into this stupid little social club that makes people feel good for a couple minutes on Sunday, and then God forbid that anyone in the world comes into our building. We want to keep judging them. We want to keep Jesus contained to right here and have nothing to do with anyone else in the world. Where did we get to the point that we're afraid to put ourselves out there for the lost? It's like we literally view the lost like they are the lepers in the Bible now. Don't go near them. Don't associate with them. Don't talk to them. You can talk about them because that's good, right? You can gossip all you want. They're going to go to hell. And if you start hanging out with them, you're of the world and you're not a Christian anymore. And you're going to hell. Church is too worldly because now it looks like the world. And if that is you, I'm sorry, but not sorry. That's what you need to hear. The church is not exclusive. It is inclusive. It is meant to include everybody. And that does not mean... That does not mean, where's the camera for the internet? That does not mean that we tolerate sin and that we will accept sin, but we will accept you as Jesus accepts you. We will not tolerate your sin and we will not justify your sin. But I will not judge you because that is not my job. That is God's job. But we just shove the lost and we shove the broken away and that is nothing that Jesus ever did. And I refuse, I refuse to be afraid of that. I refuse to base my reputation on the likes of man instead of helping people find their redemption. I refuse to be afraid. I refuse to be afraid to storm the gates of hell and shine the light back to God to show the world that his glory is still real. I refuse to accept that everyone else can back down that all they want. They can keep running from the lost, but I'm not going to stop fighting for the lost. I will not stop defending the lost against the evil that is over their lives, against the evil that is trying to run their lives, that is trying to destroy everything about them. I will not stop. I will continue to try to reach them in every single way possible. And if nobody else is going to do it, and if nobody else is going to stand beside me to do it, I'll stand by myself with God. Because with God, it is the majority. God is all you need to be the majority. If no one else is going to do it, I will be the voice in the wilderness crying out and making sure that you know that God loves you and he is trying to save you from eternal damnation and hell. I will continue to shout that God saves you in order to remake you, to renovate you. He didn't redeem you so that you can feel good in church. And the only other time you say God is when it's followed by a four letter word the rest of the week when somebody cuts you off in traffic. 
God saved you for his glory because he wants you and he wants to see you renewed. But it's going to take some time. It takes time to tear down the inside of a house to remodel it. It takes time to refinish something. It takes time to tear down the walls. It takes time. Have you ever looked at a piece of artwork and seen how beautiful it was? And you look at the Mona Lisa or the, the thing with Adam, the creation of Adam, or any picture, Van Gogh, whatever it is, and you wonder how can somebody be so extremely just talented and creative? Because I can't draw to save my life. You're getting a stick figure. That's all you're going to get. But what we see when we look at these artworks is the finished product. We can't go back and view and see and ask them, hey, what was it like to make this? We see the end result. We see the reward. We do not see the pain behind the process. If you x-ray an old piece of art, you will find that you can actually see the multiple attempts that it took to get there. You see the times that they failed and you see the struggles that they got it, that they tried to get it right. And too often, that's how we look at people. We look at all the struggles and where they got it wrong. And they would paint it. And something was off. Something wasn't right. Maybe there was a line that was wrong or there was a color that they didn't like. I saw one the other day that the guy was like seven foot tall. And then as soon as you x-rayed it, he was about three foot nine because, you know, he wanted to look a lot better for the people in history instead of exactly how tall he actually was. So they would paint it and maybe the owner didn't like it. So he would have them paint it again and they would fail and they would go again and they would fail and they would do it again and again and again and again until they finally got it right until the last time where they were satisfied and finished. But that took time for them to get there. And sanctification takes time to clean us up from the inside out. But hear me back in Genesis. God said, let there be light, and he saw that it was good. He spoke the land and the sea and the sky into existence, and he saw that it was good. He spoke the sun and the moon and the stars into existence, and he saw that it was good, and he spoke the animals and the fish into existence, and he saw that it was good. But when it came time to make mankind, when it came came time to create man, he literally said, let us make man in our image. And he got down in the dirt and he formed Adam like a piece of clay. And he wanted to be physically involved in the process of creating man, just like he wants to be physically involved in recreating you. And when he was done, he stepped back and he said it was all very good. God doesn't make mistakes. God didn't make a mistake when he called you. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. He didn't make a mistake when he made your personality the way that it is. God doesn't make a mistake. He makes a masterpiece. We are his masterpiece. We are the crown, the achievement of his creation. Before you were formed in the womb, he already loved you and said that I like this one. This one is good. He loves you just the way you are, but that doesn't mean he wants you to stay that way. He accepts you as you are, but that doesn't mean he wants you to stay that way. Jesus was accepted by God before he did a single work of ministry, before he did a single miracle. Jesus didn't do his ministry for validation. He did it from validation of God. And religion, religion is where you obey so that you may be accepted. You may be accepted. Relationship is where Jesus accepts you so that you will end up obeying him. Religion will never change your heart. It's just going to harden it. It gives you a hierarchy to judge others by the merits of your own terms and your own thinking. And Jesus didn't condemn anyone to save them. He loved them. He loved them first. He loved them. And then he told them, go and sin no more. But too many Christians have it backwards and they think that you can bash somebody into being better. And my presidential campaign is going to be bash back better for the church. Do better. Then maybe we'll accept you. Join our church and follow the bylaws and our policies for the next three years. And as long as you don't do anything and you don't badmouth anybody and you come to every potluck and serve in every ministry imaginable, especially the nursery, then maybe we're going to accept you into our club and maybe we'll love you. But as soon as you leave the room, we're just going to gossip about you behind your back and talk about that. You see what they were wearing. Can you imagine living like that? All 
that so that they can feel better about their own insecurities. Listen, God doesn't call you to clean up before you come to church. He doesn't call you to clean up before he can use you. Look at the people in the Bible. He loved you first. He is right in the mess with you, in the middle of it the entire time to pick you up when you stumble, when you trip, because it's all baby steps until we get to heaven. He is there to steer you back on track. Do not run from him when you feel scared or when you sin. Because when you don't feel worthy enough to be around him or by him, that is exactly the time that you need to seek him the most. It is the lie of the enemy that tells you that you're not a good person. It is the lie of the enemy that tells you God doesn't love you. God hates you. It is the lie of the enemy that tells you that nothing you do is ever going to be good enough. You're just going to keep messing up. But that's not true. Run to God. Run to him. He is the only one that is working it out for your good. It has never, ever been about anything that we do or can do, have done, will do, might think about doing. It's always been about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It is all according to the plan of redemption that he set in motion before time ever began. He created you out of love and he went to the cross because of his love. He was murdered because of his love. And he rose to life so that we too may have eternal life because of his love. That was always the plan. And if it was his plan then, from the beginning, imagine the plans that he still has over your life that he wants to work out for your good before you even get to heaven. All for his glory. He did it all for him for his glory and he did it all because he loves you all because he loves you there is nothing you can do to stop God from loving you and he did everything he took everything on him just because he loves you and to some it means nothing and it will never mean anything to some but for those of us that want our hearts transformed instead of having our ears tickled We understand the grace. Nobody knows how you really are other than you and God. Nobody knows. And he knows everything about you and he accepts you exactly as you are right now, today. Regardless of anything you've done or will do, he accepts you and his blood has covered you. There's people that hate the fact that I have tattoos and shame on you for thinking the blood of Jesus can't cover up some ink. It covers everything. If it can't cover ink, it's not going to cover my sin. And that's not the case. Jesus loves you. He still loves you. And I'm sorry if you got church hurt, but that's not the way that it works. If you went to a restaurant and you had a bad meal, you don't stop going to restaurants. Just because somebody hurt you at church doesn't mean you stop going to church. You stop going to that one because they're stupid. And then you find another one that preaches Jesus and preaches the Bible. And if you don't like this, awesome. Go on our website, down at the homepage. We have a whole bunch of other churches that are local. Find a biblical church and get involved. The kingdom of God is at hand. I don't know if you know this, but there is a lot of stuff going on right now that is pointing to the Bible living itself out. It is what has happened, and it is what is always happening. Is, is happening. And there is one day it's going to end. And the choice is literally completely all yours on where you're going. And if you're one of those people that thinks, oh, I'm going to do what I want, when I want, and then right before I get in a car accident, I'll just say, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Shocker, that's not going to happen. I don't know if you've ever been in a car accident or had anything explode in your face or anything happen. It's too fast. You're going to get oh out before anything else, and it ain't going to have anything to do with Jesus. And not only that, Jesus is not after your words. He's after your heart. If we can't stand on our feet, I want to give everybody the opportunity. We do a prayer after every service. And this is not a magical prayer. It is not a get into heaven free card. 
there's a lot of people that think the sinner's prayer is not biblical. This is an opportunity to apply the Bible, to confess with your mouth if you believe in your heart. That is what the thing is. If you believe in your heart, it doesn't matter if you say it with your mouth if you don't believe it in your heart. And God loves you more than anyone on this planet ever can or ever will. More than your dog loves you. And you can leave it in a trunk and it'll still love you when you go take it out. Your wife won't. Don't do it. God loves you. God loves you. He just wants you to come back home. We don't realize the depth of the depravity in the world and the problems that we face. We're not fighting flesh and, flesh and blood. We're fighting principalities. Our entire existence is surrounded by the realm of heaven and the realm of hell fighting a battle and we are stuck in the middle of it. And everything, because Satan is the ruler of this world for a time, everything is designed against you to get you to not want anything to do with Jesus. That's why it's not the cool thing. But there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And you will either be saying, Jesus, you are Lord out of awe and love and adoration. Or you're going to be saying, Jesus, you are Lord out of fear and regret and remorse. And my job is to try to make sure that doesn't happen for anyone in here. So if we can, bow our heads and close our eyes and repeat after me, everybody in here. Heavenly Father. I thank you that you sent your son to die for my sins and to be rose again so that I too may live. Jesus, you are my savior. I accept you into my heart and I will follow you the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. If that is the first time you are saying that, there is a party in heaven celebrating your arrival in acceptance into the kingdom and into eternal life. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.